And so gold made a new all-time high price by, was it January? So late January, early February, 2009. So it had its dip, but its deep, its dip was a deep V. You know, the S&P took, was it 10 years? Before it, you know, retained the high that it had in, mm -hmm. in uh, 2007. That was a long time. And gold was quick. So everyone, everyone knows that. And so logically, gold is the thing you shouldn't sell. And, if, you know, and if other people are selling it, gold is the thing you should buy. Um, you know, right after the sell-off. And so that'll keep the the dip shallower. I, I think it's likely to be shallower than anything else. And then, you know, first to recover it to, you know, greater and greater highs. Because gold is the thing you want to have. If, there, if you know, debt's in crisis and ultimately the currency is in crisis, what's the anti-currency play? What's the thing that isn't some other property's liability? It's gold. Welcome back to Capital Gotham, guys. Today we've got Keith Weiner back on the show. A great pleasure talking to Keith. Always fun, always informative. Keith, thanks so much for coming on, coming back on, I should say. Thanks for having me. As always, hey guys, if you enjoy this content, I'd like to remind you to hit that subscribe button, like the videos, and comment down below. Let us know your thoughts. And with that, all of that said, all the YouTube stuff out the way, Keith, let's just you know talk brass tacks what do you see in terms of broad strokes of the economy right now what's your macro thirty thousand foot view of the economy right now i think credit is heading into trouble so the reason why i say that you know the marginal borrower the marginal debtor got used to falling interest rates for four decades and every time they tried to blip interest rates up either to prove to the market that they still could or they had some sadistic desire to, to turn the knob back up, um, you know, credit markets got into trouble because if if the incentive to borrow was a drop in the interest rate, that, that mean, I mean, to, to a business borrower, that means that it didn't make any business sense to borrow at, let's say, 5%, but when the rate fell to 3.5%, you had a business case to borrow. But what happens if they turn it back up to 5 after you've already made your commitment? Mm -hmm. You're screwed. Um, the next time your debt is to roll over, and you know, let's face it, all debt is basically perpetual and therefore rolling, um, and it continues to grow exponentially. So all this debt is out there continuing to grow. It needs ever falling interest rates in order to be sustained, which isn't sustainable in itself for other reasons. Um, and they turn up the interest rate, and suddenly all the marginal borrowers are submarginal. Um, so, you know, what do we mean by margin? I think one good way to look at it is a zombie corporation which the Bank for International Settlements defines as a company that uh, its profits are insufficient to cover its um, interest payments, uh, its debt service. And, you know, basically it doesn't really have any crazy upside. It's not like a tech company that, you know, when, when they get the tech tune just right, it's going to have explosive growth and they'll grow their way out of it. I mean, the mature businesses that basically are drowning in debt. And um, before interest rates were hiked, and I haven't seen an update uh, on this data set in a while, um, something like 20% of all the corporate debt was zombie. That meant it couldn't be supported even at the interest rates at that time. And now we've we've gone from essentially 0% to essentially 5 point you know, something percent. Massive, massive increase. And so what we've done is if 20% of all the debtors are beneath the margin, we've just moved the margin up. It's kind of like minimum wage. Suppose you set the minimum wage at eight bucks an hour and suppose that sub-marginalized uh, 20 percent of the workforce that there's 20 percent of the people that wanted a job couldn't produce enough to justify being paid eight bucks and then you you, you know you hike the minimum wage to 13 dollars an hour five point increase you know, you've just increased the hurdle that they have to get over to be employed not only are they not getting a job ever but now there's a whole new group of people whose productivity was worth eight dollar and one cent up to you know fourteen dollars and 99 cents that um and now suddenly, you know, sub-marginal. That's what they've done to debtors. So um, mm. that takes a while to play through. Uh, everyone understood after 2008, you want longer liabilities. You don't want one year, two year maturities. You want five year, whatever. So as these things are resetting, uh, you know, everyone's lo you know loans are rolling and, and interest rates are resetting, then they're getting into deep trouble. So the way I like to frame it is the Fed is officially, as in by law, mandated to do two things simultaneously 
um, and let alone the impossibility of doing one, you know, they're doing two. And by their own theory, these two are incompatible. And one is stable purchasing power of the money, um, which the Fed is not control over anyway. Um, and then number two, um, you know, full employment, uh, whatever that means. And so stable purchasing power of the money means relentlessly debasing the currency at 2% per year. So I think Orwell would be rolling over in his grave at that one. Um, and then stable in unemployment or stable or full employment means, you know, something like three or four or five percent unemployment. Another Orwellian you know, twist. Anyways, this give, and, and the mainstream theory holds that employment and inflation are a trade off. So this gives the Fed broad latitude to do whatever the heck they want to do. And then they can always post hoc goal seek, you know, their answer to rationalize. Oh, well, you see where. Today, we're talking out of this side of the mouth, and we're trying to maximize employment. And tomorrow, we're talking out of this side of the mouth, and right now we're trying to deal with inflation. And they can do whatever they want and just pivot between these two stories. Very convenient. I mean, if you were trying to design a, uh, you know, incipient dictatorship, this would be a, a great, you know, recipe for doing that. But anyways, I don't think the Fed actually cares about either of those two things. They don't care if you have a job, and they don't care if your bank account is dwindling in value. That's not their concern. I guess, as, as they say in the modern parlance, that's a you problem, not a me problem. Um, I also don't think, a lot of people say, well, the Fed is a put under the stock market. They, they don't want stocks to go down or real estate. To go. I don't think they care about that stuff either. They care about one thing, which is the solvency of the crony you know, banks. Um, now, that ties to everything else because if, if debtors are able to service their debts, um, then the stock market's generally going up and people are generally employed. And um, so, you know, you see GDP is good, employment is good, stocks are good, all the things that people think the Fed is, you know, a sophisticated player of 3D chess, 4D chess with their with their fingers manipulating all the levers of the of this impossibly complicated monetary system. Um, people think, okay, well, they're, you know, they're doing all the things to, you know, that we want, right? We want jobs and we want stocks going up and, um, you know, we want, uh, you know, 2% inflation or less or whatever. And I think the Fed's hitting all those things. They're just, you know, tinkering with the system to keep the marginal debtors from defaulting. The credit must flow. You know, it's like Dune, the spice must flow. The credit must flow. I wonder if Frank Herbert was a student of the monetary system. Complete uh, random non sequitur thought there. So um, when... You know, the credit isn't flowing, which at five and a half percent interest rates uh, as a big problem, then at some point the marginal debtors are getting squeezed. Now, as long as the marginal debtors are, I don't know, um, Ethiopia and Argentina and Turkey, then the Fed can, with great equanimity, you know, just say, well, you know, there's trouble out there in the world, and but these are trouble spots anyway, and you know. And, and meanwhile, either they either that was a feature that, you know, it's part of how the U.S. government is playing geopolitics or, OK, it's a bug, but a minor one. You know, we can live with that collateral damage that, you know, people in this country are now, you know, destitute by, you know, our policy decisions. But if um, the kind of debtors that are, um, you know, owe money to the, the crony banking system in the U.S., if those debtors are getting into trouble, which could be. Americans who have a, a monthly payment on their pickup truck, it could be small business, it could be corporations big and small. When those guys are suddenly pressed into default, then the Fed is forced to spring into action and uh, say that we're cutting interest rates. And then they play, you know, the left side of the mouth, well, you see it's about protecting jobs and inflation is okay, you know, and they, and they, they pander to the narratives, but the reality is they're trying to prevent, um, you know, another 08 uh, you know, crisis. So now whether that crisis is going to come or whether the Fed has acted quickly enough to avert it, I don't know. I suspect that by the time the Fed is seeing, you know, I, I liken them to um, some ivory tower academic and they're sitting in their ivory tower and their office is like on the hundredth floor and they're looking down at the tiny little ant-sized people down below and if there's little fires going on and people are shooting each other and we're like, oh, I do say down there, they would be in a spot of bother. And, and they can be very um, academic about it. And then if the, if, the, if the fire gets so big, the flames are actually licking up the side of the building all the way to the 100th floor window. Oh my God, well now we have a crisis. And I suspect that that's what 
is causing the Fed to act, and that by the time they can act, too many defaults are baked into the cake. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're going to see, uh, you know, how much wobble we're going to get here. But that's my 30,000 foot view of the economy in a nutshell at this moment. Yeah, what about the uh, the lag effect of, of the rate hiking cycle? I mean, we still haven't felt the full ramifications of it yet. And even if they do cut, a, you know, 25 basis points this or next month, 50 the, the following month, I mean, those won't really percolate through the economy until, I, I think it's like 18 months or something to that effect. Isn't that the, uh, the, the lag effect? Yeah, there can be, be very long lags. And, yeah. and as I hinted at one, now, let's say you're a company and you just issued, um, you know, five-year debt, five-year bonds, and you did that in um, January of 2022. Okay, now the Fed hikes rates starting in, was it February, end of February, early March 2022? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it takes them three or four months or whatever, and they get up to 5% something. Well, you're you're sitting pretty. You're like, hey, this is, this is perfectly fine. You know, it's not affecting us at all. They'll probably come down before our debt is due, blah, 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 blah. Now, if you did five-year debt, you know, you don't have a problem until 2027. But there are other companies that did five-year debt in 2019. And then their debt is coming due now. And and so there's there's big lags there. The other one I like to talk about is layoffs, right? So people that have jobs can generally service the, the payment on their credit card and their car or truck, their house and all that, right? But if they don't have jobs, then they can't service those debts necessarily. Usually they can't. Um, you know, far too large a percentage of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And if they're, you know, unemployment, unemployed for any length of time, then they're missing payments, you know, by definition. Um, and so employers, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in an economy that's ravaged by people call it the business cycle, it's not natural to business. It's, it's the feds and, and the government has other ways of exacerbating the cycle, but let's just call it the fed cycle. You know, in, in an economy ravaged by a fed cycle, the smart thing to do if you're a, you know, a big employer and in, in a stable, uh, you know, mature, mature market and you're a mature business, the thing to do the moment there is a whiff of a downturn is to get a big layoff and you use that to pair, you know, there's always underperforming employees and all that. You pair the dead wood, you get rid of what you have to, and you get maximum savings. You're saving all that cost of all that payroll in the months and maybe a year, a year and a half on the way down into the recession. And the moment you think the recession has bottomed and you see one pixel up, that's when you should hire and get the jump on your competitors. And that's the way to play the game mm -hmm. if you're a big company, you know, a stable company or a mature company. But the Fed has had so many, or engineered, I should say, so many head fakes between 2009 and present. And every time that companies jumped the gun and thought there was a downturn coming, you know, indicators are rolling over and let's get ahead of this and do a layoff. The Fed burned them every time. They made them rue the day that they decided to do a layoff. And these companies were begging their former employees to come back, paying them double, all kinds of stuff, please, re-signing bonuses, all kinds of stuff. But, you know, in a lot of cases, the person had moved on, moved out of state, goodwill was destroyed. You know, and even if you get the person back, the relationship is is you know damaged um and so uh you know companies are extremely reluctant to lay off because if you if you've made a mistake of laying off into three head fakes and now here's the fourth you're going to cling to your payroll and then let's say suppose this is the real downturn you're going to cling to that larger payroll longer than you should and then eventually you know regret it rue the day that you didn't make the layoff that you, know, you did the previous three times only this one's for real so I, I think that's another lag because there's a lot of different reasons why these things lag and the lags are variable. So the lag on, you know, when the, um, the debts roll over, that's one set of, you know, cycle. And of course they're all staggered. And then the lag on layoffs is another cycle. Um, and you know, there's a lot of other factors. So yeah, there's big, there's big lags and they're variable and, you know, hard to predict unless you're studying that particular data. Right. So I've seen graphs every once in a while with the wall of maturities month by month by month out for the next three or four years how much debt is maturing this month and you know somebody has that data and you can study that it's okay i think it's going to be here you know that data in itself i don't think necessarily is that predictive but if you had other data sets and other things you might be able to predict recession and you know and there are people that claim to be able to do that
Yeah. So in, in the midst of all of this, you know, ter- turmoil, let's say, uh, gold's been making new all time highs. Is gold mm-hmm. has gold effectively priced in the, the rate cuts, do you think? Um, or is gold signaling something else in your opinion? You know, there's so many different constituencies in the gold market that in many cases, they're not even aware of the U.S. rate cycle. It's not even, you know, consideration. I mean, if you're if you're in Turkey and the currency is unstable and you're buying gold because owning the lira is just suicide, you know, are you reading about you? I mean, you, might, you know, the, US, the paper would cover U.S. rates, but is that really you know, foremost of your mind. So I'm in Dubai at the moment and talking to people in the gold business here, um, confirming something that I've been saying for, for quite a while um, in, you know, both interviews and some of the things I've written, which is this market is trading differently uh, than, you know, let's call it your your uncle's, um, you know, 2012 to 2018, you know, kind of bear market traded. And that market for that six or seven year period, um, and, and even, you know, beyond that, you, you know, when the price would go up, demand would just evaporate. And um, and the fundamentals would just turn. So we we follow the, the gold basis that's on our, you know, monetary-metals.com with tons and tons and tons of papers and material. We have a daily updated graph of the basis, uh, all for free. Um, you know, we'd look at the basis indicator and as the price would blip, you just see the fundamentals just evaporate uh, time and time and time again. And I think I made a, I pissed, I wouldn't say enemies like for real, but I pissed off a lot of gold people every time the price would blip, whatever, 50 bucks. Um, and everyone said, that's the moonshot. There it is. Gold's going back to 2000. I'm like, that's not the $2,000 moonshot that, you, you know, that you're looking for, you know, the Obi-Wan, you know, Jedi mind trick thing. It's just, it's just not happening. You just see in how it traded. Um, this market is different. And as the price is going up, the basis is firm. Um, and uh, it's just a different, you know, reality. And I think there's, a, I, you know, I've been talking about before major worlds that are buying. When, the West is sitting on the side right now. And Americans, Canadians, Australians, Brits, Germans, you, you know, there's not a lot of appetite for gold at 2,500 plus because they don't believe it. Because, you know, again, just like the employers that, that got burned how many times with the head fakes, the gold community is in, in the West, the ones that are price sent, you know, price traders aren't really buying it. I mean, literally and figuratively. But you have the Chinese, you have the Turks, you have the Indians, and you have the Arabs who, who have been buying it. And so uh, I just met with some folks today that just reconfirmed the same thing. Now they're on the physical side. So they're, uh, you know, they, they produce and sell, you know, gold for, for sale in the market here in various forms. And they're saying that, yeah, normally, like historically, when the price would go up, demand would drop, and that isn't really happening right now. That demand is ro- robust. You know, volumes are booming here in Dubai, even at twenty five fifty. Um, and so that's just one anecdote. And uh, I always joke that, um, and I think this is an old saying in, in data circles: the plural of anecdote is not data. Um, but I, I think that confirms everything else I'm saying is how the basis is working, and that's why the price has moved relentlessly to this level. It hasn't just been this head fake. You know, when gold went from 20 to 2050, if this was 2016, it would have gone to 1800 shortly thereafter. It didn't, right? It's It's been pushing higher and a lot of people, you know, smart people that, that aren't given to, uh, you know, histrionics are saying that, you know, 2200 had been the ceiling and now 2200 may be the floor. I'm not necessarily putting a lot of faith in, in technical analysis, but you can kind of see it. I mean, the demand is at a, at a different level from from where it was before. Right. And then at the same time, you see similar price action by way of silver. Um, silver still weighs away from its all-time high, unlike gold. But if you look at silver from a year-to-date POV, uh, it's pretty much tracing the price of gold. Uh, but what's... if if gold is being driven by central bank buying, particularly from the East, uh, what is the catalyst behind silver's recent move? So just to clarify my remark, I, I'm not talking about central buying, central bank buying. I'm talking about buying by the people, mm-hmm. which is a much, much bigger force. Right. You, you know, the average person in Turkey 
or is there a minimum amount of gold that somebody in Turkey would have is something like 10 grams and the average person would have a lot more than that. Everywhere you go, there's, I mean, you know, gold, you know, merchants, same thing in the Arab world here. Um, so silver is a bit different. And according to the guy that I met with today, um, he's got quite a lot of silver in inventory. And he said, when the price dips, that will all be sold through. So he was sort of explaining, like, why do I have, I don't normally have this much inventory. You know, monetary metals, we finance inventories. And, you know, we do that by, by paying interest to the, you know, gold and silver investors that put up the metal for this. And it goes into this inventory. And he's like, yeah, we're going to reduce the inventory. We don't normally carry that much. Right now, we have a lot of this inventory because, you know, silver is at 30 bucks. And when the price drops, that's when the demand will come back in. So silver is a little different, at least from, from his perspective. And, um, you know, so we, we calculate um, a fundamental price. I can talk about that if you want. Uh, and for gold, it's like 2,800. Um, and for silver, it's like 32 to $33. So yeah, it's a little bit above the market. Um, you know, not as, not as much above and it, you know, it, it, it isn't behaving quite the same way. And that's because gold is gold and, you know, nothing else, even silver really is remotely close to it. Um, and, um, you know, the other thing that I think is worth saying is I think silver is the working man's, um, you know, gold is too expensive for working people. And especially if you want to take 10% of your paycheck and put it into metal, you don't really get a satisfying amount of gold. I mean, you can do it, but of course the premiums are very high for tiny little bits of gold. But silver, you know, you get a small handful of it. Um, and so if the working people are a little bit suffering or, or you know compressed and silver will show that you know, with gold you know not necessarily yeah so you mentioned a fundamental price as it relates to silver do you, do you want to unpack that a bit so we we built a model and i always uh i always quote um i think his name was charles box who said all models are wrong some models are useful and i think that's i think that's important to say that so we have a model with you know that being said we have a model uh, but what it does, it says, okay, the gold market is composed of various kinds of players and you have people that are hedging that have no real net effect on, on price. Um, and then of the the people that are affecting price, I mean, you have the people that are just buying metal, um, you know, either whether they're jewelry customers, whether they're buying coins and bars, they're buying metal or selling it. And then you have the speculators that are doing it with futures. And the thing that makes them important um, is that futures give you 20 to 1 leverage if you want it. Um, I think in the FX market, XAU, you know, treat it as a currency, you might get 100 to 1 leverage on that. Mm. I'm not sure about that, but generally FX gives you like 100 to 1. Um, so you get very great leverage, which means, you know, the same amount of capital can push the price around, at least temporarily, a lot more than, um, you know, if you put that capital into buying or selling actual metal. Uh, and so, you know, that pushes the price either up or down from where it would clear if it was just a purely metal clearing market only. And, uh, you know, a lot of the gold bugs think this is always negative. It's always pushing the price down. And of course, they think the amount that it is pushing the price down is thousands and thousands of dollars. Like gold would be, you know, scare quotes, you know, $10,000, $20,000, $50,000 an ounce, but for some grand suppression scheme that's been going on for 30 or 40 years. Um, the kind of the magnitude of how much the speculators can move things around, you know, could be 10%, could be a couple hundred dollars maybe in gold, um, you know, as it is right now, 2550, you know, the fundamental price is just under 2800 as of a few days ago. Um, so, you know, the, the speculators, like think of uh, two steel posts and you have a rubber band tension between the posts. And there's times when you're pushing down on the rubber band and the rubber band has this v-shape like this and there's times when you're pushing up on it and the rubber band is like that and so what we're trying to measure is that delta how far stretched is it and in what direction and um you know that's so that's what we come up with 2780 or 1800 and in, in gold and you know 32 bucks roughly in silver is by attempting to measure that and attempting to back out of the price the effects of the speculators it's an inexact art. I mean, we have a model. I think it's a pretty sophisticated one. You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily, um, 
you know, bet the price has to hit 20. First of all, for two reasons. One, the model price is, in, you know, is inexact. And number two, the fundamentals are changing every day. You know, today, if people were buying the physical and tomorrow that, you know, you can't, it's not a physical object that has momentum. Like if I throw a rock and you observe the rock is flying at five meters a second, the next second it will still be flying at five meters a second until it hits something or air friction will slowly, you know, uh, reduce its speed. Um, that, that doesn't really apply in a market. I mean, every transaction is discrete and the next transaction is unrelated to the previous. And so, you know, just because Tom, Dick and Harry bought today doesn't mean, you know, Mary Sue and Joe will buy tomorrow, maybe. And obviously, you know, if there's a bigger driver that's forcing, you know, people to come to market to buy, as long as that driver is impelling them, you, you, know, you get you get that buying. And that's what we're trying to talk about. But, you know, the fundamentals do change. And so, you know, you can't just bet on 2,800. And, and also there's no timing component. It doesn't say that it has to happen by tomorrow. Um, you know, the, the gold price and the, or the fundamental price can be above or below the gold you know market price for relatively long periods of time certainly months um and then you know and then it eventually converges and goes and can go the other way but not necessarily tomorrow yeah one one interesting thing that i noticed uh back when the yen carry trade was unwinding was that you know you had the crypto markets crash you had not crash i mean correct severely uh, you had, you know, the stock market had also have a severe correction, but the the gold market actually held up fairly strong, um, relatively speaking. Uh, we didn't. We seems like we had support somewhere around that lower twenty four hundred dollar range. Do you see this as a sign to come? Should we have like another major market sell off? You know, does is gold? You know, everything sells off in these kind of events, but it appears that gold was the. Uh, the least hampered. Do you think that'll be the case in another liquidation event? I've been saying that since probably 2016 and 2017. In the next 2008, I think gold, you know, so 2008, the price of gold dropped, you know, 30-ish percent. You know, been, it hit $1,008 in the spring. I think it's low with 690. So basically call that 700, it's basically 30% drop. And this time around, I think the drop will be smaller for two reasons, I think there's less leverage playing in the gold market now than there was, you know, in general. Um, and the gold people probably tend to be the people that are a little bit less inclined to play with leverage versus 2001 to 2008. Um, and number two, everyone knew how that worked out. And now, you know, Pavlov's dogs have their expectations set that, yeah, gold is the thing that's gonna be first out of the chute. And so gold made a new all-time high price by was it January, so late January, early February, two thousand nine. So it had its dip, but it's deep. It's dip with a deep V. You know, S and P took was it ten years before it you know reattained the high that it had in, mm -hmm. in uh, two thousand seven. That was a long time, and gold was quick. So everyone everyone knows that, and so logically, gold is the thing you shouldn't sell, and if, you know, and if other people are selling it, gold is the thing you should buy. Um, you know, right after the sell-off. And so that'll keep the the dip shallower. I, I think it's likely to be shallower than anything else. And then, you know, first to recover to, to you know, greater and greater highs because gold is the thing you want to have. If, there, if, you know, debt's in crisis and ultimately the currency is in crisis, what's the anti-currency play? What's the thing that isn't some other party's liability? It's gold. Are you in the market for gold and silver? Then if so, please consider Miles Franklin. They are my gold and silver dealer of choice. So not only do they have super competitive prices that you're going to have a really hard time finding elsewhere, but then they also have top-notch customer support. I know Andy Schechtman, the owner of Miles Franklin, top-notch guy. I wouldn't be recommending them to you if I didn't have faith in their product mode. What, what you really want to do, however, you want to email them at info at milesfranklin.com and you want to say that Capital Cosm sent me in the description line because when you do that, you can get access to their special pricing sheet. You want to get that special pricing sheet because you're going to get special prices that you won't find on the website itself. So email them at info at milesfranklin.com 
Tell them that Capital Cosm sent you and you won't be heckled with spam emails, etc. There's no commitment necessary. I promise you that. And with that said, I will let you get back to the video. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we, we mentioned the, the yen carry trade um, at the start of the question. Uh, do you think that's over, by the way? Has that largely uh, been quelled? You know, I've heard numbers that an enormous percentage of the total estimated carry trade unwound, you know, within a day or two or something. I'm not sure I buy that. I think there's so much of it that has been put on over decades. My guess would be there's a heck of a lot more to go. And it was just like after 2008, everyone said, oh, the real estate market's a lot less leveraged. You know, especially the first few years, it wasn't residential mortgages. The you know, residential mortgages were falling as home prices were already starting to climb after, let's say, 2010, 2011. And I said, you know, you may not be able to see where the credit is tied to, but absolutely is financed on credit, but the credit may not be localized to, there may not be a mortgage on the deed. So for instance, if, if BlackRock, which we now, we knew later, I don't think that came out in 2010, but you know, in later years, we knew that BlackRock was buying these houses. There's leverage there, but that's like selling bonds in the bond market. That's not, um, you know, going to the bank and getting a residential mortgage, getting that guaranteed by Fannie Mae and, you know, selling it into the mortgage bond market. That's not how that worked. And so I think the same thing, there may be a lot of things that don't necessarily look like yen carry trade that are going to turn out to be yen carry trade. Now, will it reverse? I don't know. I mean, if you have the volatility that you had, right? So the yen fell as, did it get, it get to 160 per, 160 per dollar, something like that? Uh, yeah, maybe was a, maybe I, th I think maybe a little below that too. Yeah, I could be wrong. And then it snapped back violently to 145 or something. I mean, that's a big move <laughs> for foreign exchange and people are using big leverage on these things. So, you know, the marginal ones, the ones that are most sensitive to that, um, you know, or I guess, or rather, the ones that had shorted it for to, to ones who had carried it, put on their carry trade in between uh, 145 and 160. Uh, you know, especially the ones that got were, you know, if you shorted 145, you might have been okay. If you shorted 160 or 161, and then it goes to 145, you're just creamed. Um, but what about the entire world been putting on the carry trade for 40 years? You, you know, they're did all that flush out? I, 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 there's no way that I think that. I think there's a heck of a lot more. On the other hand, I'm very bearish long term, the yen anyway. So those people may turn out to be right with volatility along the way. Yeah. So it, it seems like there's so many macro factors. One of the, 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 the prime ones is the yield curve, right? The 10 2 spread. Uh, so far, it's been the steepest uh, inversion of the yield curve while at the same time being the longest inversion of the yield curve. Uh, what's newsworthy, however, what's even more newsworthy, actually, is that it it appears to be flirting with that 0% range. So it does appear to be uninverting now. And as you you, know, you well know, um, it's really the uninversion that precedes you know, the crisis. Uh, so are we about to uninvert? And then what does... What does the fact that it was the steepest and the longest mean? What does that imply exactly for the outcome on the other side? Well, the, the, the length of, of how long this lasts, I guess, is an indicator of you know, how much cumulative damage is occurring, let's say, to the banking system, because the banking system borrows short to land long. And so the more that you break that trade, the more damage you're doing you know, you know, some of it you'll see that in the balance sheet right away, and some of it, you know, be under the covers in in, in various ways that would be impossible to detect unless you're, you know, an expert in uh, bank balance sheets. Um, the steepness of it, as I guess, I, I have a very unconventional view of this. I guess that shouldn't be surprising, and I look at the inversion as. It's, it's really a very simple byproduct of, of one iron law, which is the Fed controls as it dictates, as it issues a diktat, the overnight rate. And that's just it. And it's whatever that, you know, Politburo, Goss Plan Committee says that it is, it is. And that could be right, it could be wrong, it could be completely against all the market forces, doesn't matter. And, and the rate will be pinned 
you know, in the sense that an insect is pinned under attack, that you, you know, your thumb is a lot stronger than the insect, you go right into the cork board. Um, but the Fed does not control the, you know, either the 10 year bond for sure. And then all the maturities in between, you know, are, are fighting in tension between the longer and the shorter. Uh, so the two year is pretty short and it, it, it can trade a lot with, with the overnight funds rate. Um, the longer you go out on the maturity curve, the more that what you're seeing is the actual market forces and where they're trying to go. So inversion, you know, in a, in a modern, you know, falling interest rate uh, economy, which we've had since 1981. And those drivers are still there, by the way. I mean, nothing's changed. The Fed can try to fight it for a while, but they can't win in the end. Um, and the, the longer, the farther you go out on the yield curve and stocks and real estates are perpetuities, right? So they have even lower yields than, uh, than the 10 year, which has a 10 year maturity. Um, that's telling you the actual market interest rate is what it is. That's a heck of a lot lower than, you know, so th th there should be an upsloping yield curve, but the Fed has, has pushed the short end up. So you get, you know, you get the opposite of what it should be, which is that, right? Um, so if, if, if the 10 year is, is, he, is here and, and, the, and the short end is here, it kind of tells you just how far off the Fed really is and where that should be. And so, you know, I'm not sure if I'm explaining this coherently, but 10 years is a heck of a lot closer to, um, you know, where it should be, but it's not that close. And, and the 10 year had gone up to 4% something. Now it's back in the threes. Um, you know, if we had a perpetuity, so the, you know, the UK has, uh, um, you know, these, these perpetuities that they sold in early 19th century, I think, that would give you a clearer picture of just how inverted, inverted really is. Um, but we have real estate and we have stocks that imply a much lower, you know, interest rate at, at that far out. Um, so, so the, the depth of the inversion is kind of giving you a sign of how far off the Fed is, which means how much structural damage they're wreaking by fixing the interest rate, you know, where they are, like they're trying to, whatever, fight inflation or whatever rubric that they, you know, whatever narrative they want to pander to that day. Um, but they've, they've gotten it pretty far wrong. Um, and, you know, that's it. So how much damage is accumulating? Hard to calculate it. All the economic indicators, I've written a whole long series, the GDP is at best, you know, fallacious and misleading. And at worst, it's a socialist propaganda tool to encourage economic policy towards consumptionism, consumption of capital, ultimately. Um, we don't really have you know, economic indicators to measure the kinds of damages that are occurring you know, with the malinvestment when the interest rate's falling, and then, you know, the, the 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 rotting of that debt, and then ultimately the liquidation of that when the interest rate rises. We don't really, you know, there's no data series on that. You, you know, you can look at that and say, okay, I think qualitatively this has to be happening. Uh, you know, if you're a hamburger restaurant and you have 100 stores, you always have in, the, in your back pocket a spreadsheet for building the marginal store. And you don't build that because the bottom line is red ink. And then they lower the cost of finance, lower the interest rate. And, you know, if nothing else changes, suddenly red ink turns to black, you build the store. And then the interest rate ticks down again and again and again and again. And you and every other hamburger store and you and every other pizza place and you and every other hot dog store and you and every other, you know, high-end steakhouse and on and on and on are borrowing only because of the additional inducement of the falling rate. Now you put the rate up here all that is is toast. Um, mm. Question is when. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I often make the analogy, especially when it comes to the GDP, is if uh, you know, if like half the GDP was just people buying, you know, guys buying OnlyFans subscription. I mean, you know, five hundred billion dollars of OnlyFans subscriptions that really add anything to the economy. You know, the the answer is no. So just taking like a broad cumulative stroke of. Um, uh, no pun intended, of, of just money, money being spent on something. That's not, it's, it's, uh, it's low resolution at, at best. And now imagine that they actually put that on their credit card tab. And that, Do yeah, what? That is, if they put it on the credit card, they pay for it by credit. Oh yeah. Um, that, that is, you know, kind of a nutshell of what goes on, but that adds to GDP. GDP goes up if you borrow to spend. And it goes up if the government borrows to spend. So if the government borrows another trillion to spend it on welfare, 
that adds a trillion to GDP. And um, is that good? Is that really, is the economy really growing? Well, I'd say it's consuming something. What you really would want, and this was the end conclusion of my whole series on GDP, is some sort of measure of the gross domestic balance sheet. So not measuring, you know, consumption revenues, but measuring like how much, you know, actual assets have been either added or removed. But you can't even really do that if the interest rate's unstable because asset prices are inverse to interest rates. So you need a stable interest rate, and then you can measure the aggregate balance sheet, say whether you're getting wealthier or poorer. But um, there's no such thing as a stable interest rate under fiat currency. You need a gold standard for stable interest rates. And um, so everything has been redefined. It, it's very Orwellian that the you know economics profession is just glibly selling you know, propaganda. And and I think most economists don't realize that. I don't, I don't think most economists are that cynical that, um, I mean, every once in a while you run into a Robert Reich or a Paul Krugman who absolutely are that cynical and that, um, you know, dishonest about it. And, you know, I call them court economists. You know, they're there just selling the king's propaganda. They're not um, they're not actually trying to discover truth. It's not about discovering truth. It's about selling whatever the party policy line is. And that's Krugman for sure. Um, but I think most economists are trying to do good work. The problem is, and this was Orwell's point, if they if they redefine all the keywords that matter and then they render you essentially unable to think your way out of a wet paper bag, then they, they've got you. And that's, you, you know... Uh, you know, GDP as, as one of those, as one of those metrics. Yeah. I mean, I should know this, but I don't off the top of my head. Uh, what is the percent of GDP that's um, public sector responsible? What percentage does the public sector uh, create out of the total GDP bucket? I don't have that statistic off offhand. Yeah. Cause I know in, in Venezuela, I think it's like 20%. And so I think we're awfully close to that. So 20 in Venezuela? I think so. Yeah, I've read that statistic somewhere. I, I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments down below. Um, but I, I'm just trying to compare where we're at compared to like, you know, these more overt socialist countries. The problem is, you know, the knock on effects of, of government are, you know, you have to look at the first order, second order, third order. So suppose um, the government, okay, they're going to spend, you know, X dollars. Um, and they're spending that on, let's say, some defense contractors. And the defense contractors, okay, so that that money is not double counted. The government pays the defense contractor, defense contractor pays the employee, employee spends it. That's the GD, you know, that goes into GDP. But suppose the defense contractor borrows a billion dollars to build a new factory because they know that the defense department is going to want, you know, a hundred of these fighter planes or whatever. That's another billion dollars that appears to be private sector. And, and the keyword being appears, is that really private mm -hmm. sector? Right. It's all stimulated by the government, or, you know, in, in this case, indirectly. And then what about all of the employees of the company that is doing the construction and the companies that make the equipment that, that are installed there? Those are private sector companies. And those employees go out and buy Ford trucks. And so now Ford hires more workers and borrows more money and they build another plant. Like the knock-on effects as you get into first order, second order, third order, you know, primary, secondary, third, you know, tertiary and so on, um, you know, enormous. So how, how much of everything is, is the set? You could say that's the distortion factor of how much of the economy is distorted or distended by the government spending. It's a lot bigger than whatever the government spending statistic would be. Right. Well, uh, it looks like we're coming up on time. Keith, anything else you want to talk about that we didn't get a chance to get to? Um, I, I definitely want to put in a plug. Monetary Metals has a silver bond paying 12%. That's silver interest on silver. And for anybody interested, go to our website and, uh, you know, we're, we're glad to hear from you. Uh, and we, you know, a lot of people say, how do you do that? Well, we're lending silver to a silver producer called Bunker Hill. It's a public company. Anybody can look them up. The asset is they're, they're traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange, but the mine is in northern Idaho, and uh, they produce lead, zinc, silver concentrate, and uh, there's enough silver there to to amortize the debt. So unlike all the dollar debts that are perpetually rolling, 
you know, debt denominated in money, i.e. gold or silver, is as fully amortized. That doesn't linger forever the way paper dollar debt lingers. I see. Well, uh, I'll have the link to those to, to the website down below. And uh, Keith, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for your time, as always. And, um, you know, if you guys enjoyed this content, be sure to type go Keith go in the comment section, like the video. If you disagreed with something that we talked about, definitely let us know. Really interested to get your take here, guys. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It goes a long way. It may not seem like much, but it certainly does go a long way. And with all that said, I'll catch you in the next episode. Bye, guys.